All right, looks like we're live. Welcome everybody. My name's Scott Meyer. This is Artist Network Drawing Together. So we meet every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern to draw together. This is what we're working on today. Um, this cute little guy. Um, it was a lot of fun to work on this one. Um, I'm gonna make some changes that we'll talk through, but I first wanna welcome everybody. So thank you all for joining. I love seeing where everybody is viewing from. I know here in Colorado, we just got some snow and it's beautiful out. Very cold, but it's winter. Um, kind of a, a perfect day to be working on this 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 guy here, the snow hair. Um, so if you want to follow along, the reference that's right below me here can be found in the description. So if you if you open, expand the the uh, description there and below the video, you'll find a little link that you can then copy into the browser and you can pull it up and you can actually draw along with. Um, you'll find links to Artist Network, so you can go to the Drawing Together page. Uh, so when you're done, you can share your work with everybody here. So um, if you have any questions, observations, thoughts, anything, uh, feel free to uh, join us in the, the chat field. And if you have a specific question for me, if you type it out in all caps, I am more likely to, to see it. Um, if I miss a question, um, it's possible that I just didn't see it while I'm drawing and talking. So um, there's there's no harm in just asking it again if you need to. So um, I do like to try to answer everybody's questions as much as possible. Uh, so welcome all uh, you. I love seeing all these familiar names. I wish we could all meet in person at some point, but um, okay, this little guy. Um, I worked on this one. This is uh, this preparatory one was drawn on the um, the arches rag paper, that's the, or the Stonehenge um, paper here. So this is what I had used last week, and I thought I'd give it a shot. And I like it because I really like the texture of the paper. Um, this is a little bit smaller than the, the reference image, which is size eight by ten. Um, but I thought I'd switch to the smoother, brighter white paper. Um, and that is this stuff here. This is the, I've been using this quite a bit. This is a Hanamula. Um, so, but if you have any kind of smooth white drawing paper, that should work. Um, really, I think it's, it's important to experiment to see what works best for you and the materials. Um, and I'm also gonna go a little bit larger. I, I don't really have a reason other than I just felt like it. So <laughs> I'm working a little bit larger. This is closer to a nine by 12. Um, but it's set, set to the same dimension as the eight by 10. So um, that's what I kind of chose to do. What I really like about this is that play in values. You know, the texture itself is really a thing. And of course, um, you know, this is a, a cute rabbit. Um, the, it's this, what's happening in the background and the relationship between the background and the rabbit that I think is really kind of fascinating. That was the, the most fun to really engage with, with in, the, the, uh, in the preparatory one. So I'm gonna hopefully focus on that. Um, the materials, what am I working with? I'm gonna work with the Derwent Onyx today. So these are just really soft graphite pencils. They show up a little bit better on camera. If you have a regular set um, of, of uh, pencils like I have here, um, you might choose kind of the softer ones, like the bees, um, but you may start off with some of the lighter ones as well. I think, you know, really everything, everything that we do here is transferable to, you know, a variety of media, um, including charcoal. Um, but that's what I'm going to be working with today. So I've got the medium and the dark. Uh, I have my trusty blending stump here, which we'll be working with. And I've got my three erasers. I'm going to be using this um, retractable rubber eraser and then I also have my uh, my Tombow Mono Zero for some of the detail work and then my uh, my kneaded eraser. So that is it. Oh, aside from this paper towel which I'm going to be using to blend in because I'm doing my best to stop using my hands. <laughs> we talked about that um, but it, it I, I, I use my hands a lot and then it makes these oily fingerprints on the paper and for this one, I don't really want to have that. So welcome everybody. Oh, welcome Heather. I know you've, you've missed the last few episodes, so it's good to see you back. Um, all you familiar names, Monica, uh, Adele, Julie, Tammy, everybody. Um, so let's get started. Um, let's see, I'm just doing a quick scan of the settings. I made some adjustments to this just to make sure that we don't have the buffering issues that we've had the last couple episodes. So. Um, but if, if you do notice that something freezes or something stops, just hang on for a bit and I'll, I, can tip, I can typically bring it back up in about 30 seconds or so. Um, Mabel, hello from Maine, my home state. All my family's back there, my favorite places. Um, so, all right. 
I have my reference image up here on the left and I'm going to grab my medium, uh, my medium onyx here. And the first thing I'm going to do is just really start laying in some, uh, just laying in some general tone. So at this stage, if you're letting your eyes kind of lose focus, um, that can be really helpful. At this early stage, the more you can see the subject as a, as an arrangement of abstract forms, and you don't identify with the um, with the, the, the snow hair itself, um, then you know the better. Because once we start to really label and define the subject, then we start to um, make certain assumptions about things and how to draw. We rely on that symbol system, uh, you know, the kind of the, the preconceived notions about how something looks or how we should draw it, rather than really observing. It. So this first pass that we go through is really just about reacting quickly to the subject and, um, and getting something on the page uh, from which you can react and make some specific uh, changes. And in particular, what I'm looking to do is, it's, it's all very light right now, but establish really fundamental um, structures between light and dark, um, and especially as it relates to the background, so the, the figure whether it's dark against a light background or whether it's light against a dark background. So we're just trying to establish some of those, those main, um, those main uh, kind of relationships. Uh, so using an overhand grip, I do a lot of drawing with the overhand grip. So that's really, there's you know, a few different ways to do this, but if you're new and you don't really have a whole lot of experience working with the overhand grip, I love it. Um, you really, all you have to do is place your pencil on the paper pick it up with your fingertips and you're in that grip. Um, and then from there you can modify it. I'll often draw like this with the pencil wedge between my fingers, giving myself some um, kind of stability using my, my fingertips here. But the, the benefit to working in an overhand grip is that it allows you to engage the side of the pencil so you get these broader marks. And it also, it allows the marks to just kind of float on the surface of the paper so you don't have uh, any sort of kind of embossed line uh, that you, uh, you might have to contend with later. And if you change up the direction of your marks, kind of incorporate some cross hatching, um, you'll end up with kind of a smoother tone and gradation. And then as you start to build this up, you can um, begin to be, uh, you know, pay attention to the overall proportions. And we'll, we'll kind of dig into that. I'll kind of talk through um, some of the things I think about when I'm um, correcting the proportions. And then one of the things that can be helpful when you're kind of toning the page like I'm doing now is to work quickly, work with the overhand grip, um, and build up a lot of light layers rather than trying to hit it once. And if you have really strong marks, um, keep going, and then eventually you know they'll all kind of blend together. Um, and if you, you kind of intentionally change the angle of your marks as you go, uh, you can uh, start to create a, a more even and smooth tone. So how, are, how is everybody doing? Anybody following along? Just observing? Um, hello, Cynthia. Yeah, <laughs> Ramirez. Yeah, I wish I had a rabbit like this that was able to sit for me, you know, working from life is really the optimal, um, you know, optimal kind of opportunity. So, you know, as much as you can do that, uh, that that's really going to boost your drawing skills. Um, you know, we don't really have that ability with uh, the live stream. It works best to use a photo like this and for us all to draw together. And there can be a lot of benefit just from, from working from a, a photo. But yeah, nothing beats working from life and get really embracing that challenge. All right, so I think it's time to kind of wipe this down. And as you're, as you're building up your tone, um, really consider the, the pressure on each of your strokes. So I'm moving the pencil very quickly. Um, and, but even within that, I am, you know, I'm kind of being, trying to be conscious of where the pressure is in each stroke. So. You know, as I'm laying it down, like an extreme look at this would really be kind of like a scooping motion here. So the pressure is applied towards the center of each pass. 
with the, the graphite. Um, and if, so if you notice kind of hard ends to your marks, then what's happening is you're just kind of, you're leaning into the ends a bit too much. Um, and so try to put your pressure kind of in the middle and lift off and land gently on the page and that'll create some nice soft transitions. Uh, Monica's got to start shoveling. It's too bad. Hopefully you can view later. All right, so I think, you know, my, my primary, primary focus right now is just toning that ground and starting to build up some, some fundamental value relationships. I've got these interesting dark marks. Just wanna see, I've had some issues with my camera lately, making spots. Um, and so I don't know, I, oh crap, it might be my camera. <laughs> There might be something on the lens uh, that I, I can't quite get off that's making these, these spots, but um, we'll see. So I'm just going to keep going. And that kind of helps. Oops. I'm just going to keep kind of wiping things down, building up tone. And I guess, I think in really particular, I think what I want to do is really dark in the background here. One of the things that is really kind of fun about this is that, you know, we're dealing with white on white in terms of the subject, right? You know, we've got the white snow, we've got the white hair here. Um, but of course, because of the play of light, you know, the optical truth here is that we're looking at tones of gray. Um, actually, I'm gonna turn off these lights there. And then, Here we go. Um, okay, that's better. Um, there was a shadow being cast there that I needed to get rid of. Um, so as I'm doing this, I'm gonna start to define kind of the right side. Um, and so within this, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about some angle sighting. So we've got this really kind of soft curve here, but as much as you can, if you can break it down into a series of kind of shorter straight marks um, and see the general angle, you'll ultimately get the curve better. And so I'm trying to kind of in my mind, I'm, I'm trying to find that angle. And in a lot of what we do when we draw is we split our attention. We've talked about this before. So I may be looking at the reference image, but I'm putting my awareness on the paper and I can see what's happening out of my peripheral vision. And that gives me a sense of the, the angles that I'm making and trying to match my, the, the motion of the pencil with the, with the angles that I'm observing in the subject. Um, so this is, it can be really helpful to allow your mind to kind of wander as you, as you keep your eyes fixed on one subject, um, put your awareness on other things other aspects of it. You know, so as I look for the angle of the ear here, um, I'm kind of holding that angle in my, my mind. I'm keeping my eyes fixed on that, but I'm paying attention to what's happening out of the line, out of my eye here to see that they align. And I can double check it by doing some kind of angle sighting. Um, and if I'm, if I'm ever using any terms, if you're new and you're, you're not familiar with some of these terms like angle sighting uh, or maybe comparative measuring, let me know and I'd be happy to explain them. Um, and so I'm just trying to build up these broader areas of tone that we'll refine later because it takes a while for us to really sit with the subject and understand the forms that we're seeing and get the proportions right, get the angles right. Um, and so these initial marks should be very general. Rocket 434, welcome back. I'm glad you're able to able to join us. Um, hello, Gabby. Yeah, that little spot right there, I think is from my, my camera lens. So I'm gonna do my best to ignore that, it's frustrating. But um, I can see actually if it, yeah, it looks like it's on the, on the lens, or more precisely underneath the lens. Um,
So one of the you know one of the things that we, we've talked about this before, but one of the things that can be um, kind of challenging or what we might often have to fight is our own instincts to go right to the details. You know, we often um, we often think that we understand the subject better than we actually do um, initially. We have to kind of sit with that subject and really take our time to study it. Um, and there's interesting these dark spots. What I think might be happening is I think there's some just some crud underneath the paper here. Um, so I didn't clean off the surface sufficiently before uh, before I laid the paper down, before I taped it down. And so it's going to leave some of these dark spots. But I'm not all that worried about it. I can show you how to fix that later. And one of the things we, you know, I like to kind of keep in mind as I'm working is that this is really an exercise. This isn't this isn't a finished drawing <clears throat> for me. This isn't something like a, you know, commission that I might be doing for somebody or something that I'm planning on, you know, framing and hanging up. I want to be free to be able to, you know, simply draw. And um, and then and kind of be free to make mistakes. I don't know, let it be messy. Okay, so I'm kind of establishing the the scale of that of the the back body portion of the body. One of the things I really loved about this subject is is that play of light. You know, the strong light here with the shadow must be of a tree um, here casting over the back, and so it creates that play of light and dark, where we have that that inversion from light rabbit to black dark background, dark rabbit against light background here. Um, so, and, and because we're dealing with snow, you know, we, we may, um, our, our minds might be kind of fighting with us a bit because we're thinking, oh, it's white. So we got to make it white and you lose, use a lot of the white of the paper. Um, but the truth is everything is, is dark. The darker you go, the better. Um, I may, let's see, what am I gonna do now? I'm just kind of thinking out loud about what I wanna do. Part of like what I like about using this time to tone the background is it serves as a bit of a warm up, right? It, it helps me to, um, it helps me to kind of clear my mind a little bit, loosen up, um, kind of coordinate my, you know, develop my hand-eye coordination a little bit um, get my head in the game and kind of set a plan. Uh, and so let's see, what do I need to do here? I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep smoothing this out and I'm not worried too worried about it being kind of blotchy back in that background. I can smooth that out a little bit later. Again, I think the more time we sit in this, this early stage of um, just big, broad areas, the areas, the better. Um, and we often, again, we kind of jump to those details too early. And if we, if we focus on these big values, big shapes first, then you find that those details come together really quickly. And if we focus on details too early, then it, it impedes our ability to, um, to really to get those details right, uh, so um, uh, Michelle is saying, I wish you can check my proportions. Sometimes I make things bigger. That is that's a that's a good observation. And I want to thank you for sharing that because that's something that I I really struggled with as well. In particular, I always felt like my proportions would get bigger, too big rather than too small, and um, I feel like that's a very common thing. And I have some theories as to why that is. Um, but I wish I could check those as well. You know, perhaps we can find a way to be able to share our own live drawing practices. Uh, so right now what I'm doing is just identifying some of these dark marks um, and, and the light areas, trying to target the light areas and fill them in a little bit. And with this overhand grip, you know, generally using the side of the pencil, um, you got to roll it as you go so that you're constantly kind of rounding out the, the pencil. Uh, but you can always kind of lean in and kind of tip it up and you start to engage the tip to get more control and more precision as to where you're making the marks. And so I'm just going to kind of smooth things out a little bit. 
and I just want to create a kind of a softer gradation as we kind of move down in here. We know there's going to be some light on the behind the, the back, back end of the rabbit there. Romero is drawing along with, all right. Um, yeah, I'm gonna do, you're, it looks like you're working on uh, lining up the eye with the right ear. So that's the stage you're at. Uh, it looks like you're a little bit farther along than I am. Um, the right ear is taller than the left. Let's see, it's really hard. So you can do some angle sighting as you're starting to, to place the tips of the ears. Um, and so what I'm doing is I'm closing one eye and I actually I'm gonna use my larger references off here to the left and I'm trying to establish that angle. And what I can see is that there's a slight upward angle if you connect the top, the upper portion, upper points of each of those ears. So I see a slight upward um, kind of trajectory there. All right, so what do I wanna do? I'm gonna do a little bit of, uh, give a little bit of attention to the negative space. So kind of come down from the top, evaluate this proportion and I'm just gonna gauge how I feel about it. Um, it may not be 100% accurate, but I think I can start to uh, give myself a little bit more definition here of this ear. And I'm gonna start with the left ear. Um, and that, yeah, as Romero, that as, a, as you're observing, I observe that too, that the right ear is just slightly taller than the left. And then as I'm, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to target the darker areas. So my eyes are still blurred. My vision is still blurred as I'm looking at the reference. Um, and, and rather than like, if I, if I look at this back side of the ear that's over on this side, it's a very subtle value relationship. When I squint, that edge just largely disappears. What stands out more is the, the kind of the right side, kind of the, the, that dark um, form in there. And that's what I'm going to target. I'm going to leave this soft at this point. But I can start to give it a little bit more definition there. And I'm kind of just, uh, just visually um, identifying kind of the, the length of those ears, just going by what feels good, knowing that I'll have to come back later and make some adjustments. smooth this out. All right, and then as I'm working on this form, rather than drawing a line, I'm gonna attempt to create it by, um, by building up the shapes of light and dark. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm just allowing the pencil to hover over the page to help me visualize the path. But rather than draw the line, I wanna be able to visualize it and then work on the darker background here and stop try to stop my marks on that path. Um, but by, by eliminating the line, it's going to help me later on when I'm trying to capture the, the texture. Um, I, want, I want there to be a softness and I really want the edges to play a kind of a dominant role in how um, this, uh, the, uh, the subject is defined. Um, so, and I know that if I draw a hard line, it's gonna actually be something that's gonna make things difficult uh, later. And as I come down here, that edge becomes a little bit more ambiguous. It's really difficult to see where the, you know, where the rabbit ends, where the fur ends and that background begins. Um, so I don't want to invent something. I, want to, I don't want to create a hard line when it doesn't exist. We're going to allow this thing to kind of emerge out of the snowy light there. And, and we can, if I move over here, we can kind of do the same thing. That edge is really, really difficult to define um, at right below the ear here, and I don't want to create a definition and invent something that I that I don't I can't really see. But then as we as we come along in here, then the, the back becomes far far more visible, and then I can make uh, stronger marks there. All right. So what do I want to do? Okay. Um, So what I'm doing is just doing a little bit of angle sighting along this edge here. 
kind of breaking that down and making sure that I have those angles correct. And now what I want to do is I'm going to drop a plumb line. So if I if I've located this this ear somewhere over here, the end of this ear, drawing a visual line, uh, vertical line that passes, uh, you know, directly down through the snout, and I want to make sure that that aligns with the reference image. And so it, yeah, it cuts it cuts off the the snout just a little bit. Um, so something I might have to move this move this ear a little bit, but um, and I can do the same here if. If this this ear here um, has a kind of a point, I can drop a vertical line through here and see where it passes through the body of the rabbit, which will help to control those proportions. Um, Greg, it's good to good to hear. It's tricky to to reduce the the use of line work there. So Greg, is just saying that um, you're trying to reduce eliminate my reliance on line in my work and. Um, yeah, check out Greg's work. Uh, it's pretty awesome stuff. You know, and for me, it's like, you know, sometimes I, I intentionally use more line and sometimes I intentionally eliminate it. I think it's just for this subject, I'm, I'm trying to um, be conscious of the edges and how line plays into it. All right, I'm kind of, I'm just kind of defining the top part of the ear. That's starting to become an anchor for me. And if I, if I do that, then the top of this ear over here would be a little bit taller. And I'm just kind of gauging the distance between them. And then if I draw a, drop a plumb line here, you can see that that ear now sticks out beyond the, the nose. And I think based on the reference, the nose needs to come over here. So um, before I actually start to erase anything, so I've actually kind of sh shaded in too much of that background. I've kind of cut into where the nose needs to be. I'm going to try to reestablish that um, and figure out where that, that should be, where that edge should be. And then I can erase that out. And I want to get that general angle here. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to that because I don't quite. I need to figure out how far down the nose should be, but I want to use. I need to draw a horizontal guide to see where it intersects, say the back of its back, and so I may need to actually now define this a little bit more. Um, what do I want to, what do we want to do here? All right. What I'm, what I'm doing now, I think my, in order to determine how far back I need to go, what I did is I did some angle sighting and trying to find this angle here. And then I can draw a, a horizontal guide across this way to see where it, where like this back corner kind of aligns which should be right below, right below the mouth. So the mouth kind of comes in under here. So kind of working back and forth and then also checking this angle in here. So again, using this as an anchor for my decisions um, and kind of trying to relate, um, you know, different parts of the rabbit to that. And then, so then that should hopefully make this distance um, proper. And I, as I draw this line, I want to make sure that it's not a hard edge. It's a pretty, pretty soft edge, but it is dark. But using that overhand grip allows me to kind of create a, a darker, kind of softer mark. So it's not, a, not really a line. And then what I'm going to do is so I've got this again. This ear is the anchor. As I come down, I want to evaluate the that shadow, the edge of that shadow, the path that it makes.
and then if, you know as I'm as I'm looking now, I'm trying to evaluate the direction of the marks that I'm creating, see if there's any kind of dominant directional quality to those marks, and if there is, I need to try to get rid of it. So in the background, you can create kind of more more directional marks, but we're gonna help, we're gonna actually use the texture of the fur later on in the drawing to um, kind of incorporate some of the cross contour information, which will give kind of more form and volume to the rabbit. Um, and if you're new to drawing, what, what I'm referring to is in terms of cross contour, cross contour are the marks that we make inside the form that is, describe the form of the object. So within the outer edges, we make marks that suggest the, the way, you know, the, the flow, the form, the structure of the, the object. Um, and so what we're talking about with cross contour is that, you know, if I were to create a line that kind of follows along the form of the rabbit, that's its kind of cross contour, you know, to create a suggestion of that three-dimensional quality. Um, and now, we, because we have the fur there, um, there's a directional aspect to that fur that's going to help us suggest the form. You know, it's not just a straight up and down, you know, direction of those marks. They're actually moving in a particular way that help us to understand um, what the, you know, what the structure of the rabbit actually is. And so that's what, that's what we're going to be kind of building towards. But for now, I'm just kind of setting an initial, uh, an initial um, value uh, in trying to define the basic light and shadow structure of the scene. Donna is saying, showing incredible amount of restraint and not placing the eyeball. Uh, that's interesting. I've, I'm kind of curious to, uh, to hear more from, from you, Donna, or anybody else um, where that fits in. Because honestly, I haven't even looked at the eyeball in the reference. I haven't noticed it at all. Um, and, and I don't know why that is or whether that's just part of the years of, of drawing that is where I've, I've intentionally held off drawing the eyes um, because I've, I've always gotten myself into trouble when I do the eyes first or too early in the drawing. So I'd love to hear more about that from you or anybody. Like, where do the eyes fit in in terms of process for you? Okay, let's see. Um, but in terms of your observation of it, you know, being kind of ghostly, somebody made that um, that comment there too about it, it feeling ghostly. That's the way I kind of visualize drawing is starting very broad. This is all about creating a drawing that is unified. Everything feels like it belongs together, um, and the uh, and the idea is that we we start from a place of unification starting from that white piece of paper, and then we're gradually creating divisions there on the page to, to create that, the scene and, 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 and display the, the subject. If we start with line work, um, then what happens is we jump to that division early. So you know, if I were to outline and create a contour line of the rabbit, then that creates divisions on the page, which then we have to like work to unify back again. So um, throughout you know my years of drawing, I've just kind of um, kind of adopted this process, and this is the way, largely the way I was taught to draw or to con kind of conceive of drawing, um, you know, working in this way so that it's it's gradually allowing the image to mer uh, emerge on the page, um, and everything feels like it's unified. Everything feels like it's all part of you know. Uh, part of the same drawing. So squinting helps to do that, right? Because it, it eliminates the boundaries, it eliminates the details, and allows these uh, forms to merge uh, that you know, we would often kind of perhaps overstate. So if, you're, uh, if you need to you know, take more time squinting, I probably spend 75% you know, of the drawing time with my eyes out of focus um, so that it, it helps me to and to not get too absorbed in the uh, in the, in the details too early, and for you know when I squint, you know the, I guess the eye is there, but for some reason I haven't seen it at all. So um, Brent does art. I jump right to the eyes. Sometimes I regret later. That's good to good to know. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, Mary C, I, I lightly place the eye 
which lines up with the edge of the left ear and snout. Uh, that's a that's a good observation or a good thing to to consider there. That so it sounds like what you're doing is, you know, I I had used this ear as an anchor essentially to making my proportional decisions um, built around that ear. You're just doing that with the eye. So I think that makes a lot of sense because it is actually a defined um, kind of point. So if I were to do that, like what you, what you're saying is to um, you know consider the the structure of the ears. Um, and then place the eye relative to that. So I'm going to give myself a little bit more information on this ear. Um, I think I need actually to kind of define this a little bit. That form, there's not quite enough volume here. I need a kind of a light line in there. I need to give myself a little bit more definition now along in this, this edge of the ear. Um, and one of the things I'm thinking about, if you're, if you're kind of struggling with the idea of shape versus line, try starting your marks kind of inside the form, work your way out to the edge. Um, and that can be an effective way of reducing the use of line versus kind of starting on that outer edge and then kind of shading inward. All right, so now that I have a little bit more structure here, Let's place that eye kind of lightly like you're suggesting that you do. Um, and I want to be careful not to not to create a like an almond shape, you know, and instead break it down into a sequence of short straight marks. Uh, that's ultimately going to give a bit more structure. Um, because ultimately what you're drawing when you're drawing the eye is the, actually the shape of the eyelid, the fur, the structure around it. And I think I've overstated it, but I can, I can erase in, out some of that form. But I'm gonna keep it light, just like what you were saying. Um, I kind of give myself a kind of a rough placement and then see how that aligns. So kind of double checking in uh, each of these other aspects of the, you know, the features there. Um, but one of the things also that this process might show, if you, if you are used to creating a line first and then shading it in, um, by building up a drawing this way, it allows you to see how little you can get away with, right? Um, so at this point, I've got very little detail, but you can look at this and recognize it as a rabbit, right? And in particular, I think you can make some sort of evaluation about the, um, the landscape as well. So we can kind of know that it's in snow. Uh, and so it, it helps us to then be in control over how much detail we have. Um, is, the you know ultimately what's most critical for recognition in the in the viewer is getting the main shapes and the main values right you know so and then from there the details are built in on top of that or integrated into it um, and the viewer's mind will fill in a lot of the missing detail and if you allow that to happen and you engage the viewer's mind in that way it'll ultimately be uh, more exciting I think for the viewer so kind of give the viewer's mind an opportunity to exercise itself and, um, and fill in some of that missing information. So trying to visualize this path here. I'm gonna to start to drop in some of the darker values in this shadow area. So this is again, mostly all done with this overhand grip. Um, and uh, rather than using the, the, the tip of the pencil. So kind of angle sighting this, the foot, comparing it to this ear here. And when you squint, again, it, it reduces the, um, it, it eliminates the details and it shows value relationships. So when you're squinting, um, at the and you're looking at the reference, pay attention to what disappears. If it disappears, that means the value contrast is lower than it might otherwise feel. When we focus on something, when we focus our eyes on a specific area, 
that sharp focus tends to interpret uh, the value contrast more sensitively. So we become more sensitive to value relationships when we focus, and we tend to view them as being higher in contrast than they actually are. And so that's where um, squinting your eyes is actually a, a benefit because you see the, the true value relationships more effectively, more accurately. Um, Let's see. Uh, Michelle saying, I wish to make my eye with a realistic look. All right, we'll, we'll get into that. I think when, um, when, I, when I get to the, the eye, that'll probably come in towards the end. So you might have to stick out for a while, but um, I'll kind of talk through some of my strategies for it. Um, let's see, all right. <laughs> that is art, not pfft. My outlines look like something from other planets. I'd be curious to learn more about what you're what you're describing there. Um, yeah, I, I think a lot about lines. Um, they're really, uh, they're really. It's really fascinating to me that we as humans have um, in, in, invented a process of drawing that's so natural. We all do it. We all draw with lines to represent the edge of an object, but those lines don't exist in nature, right? You know, if we look at the subject, there's not a line around that that edge. It's just a contrast between dark and light. It's where it's, the edge is different than a line, and a line is a symbol for an edge. And the fact that we as humans have invented that is really wild. And you can, you know, you can look at the ancient cave paintings from Lascaux or somewhere, and, and you can see these forms that are created with contour lines, and we understand what those objects were, you know, what, the, what they were actually drawing. It's really cool. Um. All right, again, so now I'm, I'm still trying to be mindful. If I squint, where do those edges disappear? Where do they become more, um, uh, more visible? Um, and kind of right in along here, this is something I do a lot. What I'm doing is I'm actually pointing at the reference image as a way to keep me focused. So when I, when I glance back up at the reference, I can come back to it more easily. Because um, as we start to get more focused on specific areas, um, what I'm trying to do is, you know, glance quickly, but in a very specific area. I know where I need to look and what information I need, grab it quickly so that I don't start to manipulate it in my own mind, kind of quickly take that observation and then come back to the drawing um, to, to see if I'm in the right spot or not. Uh, because what can happen is when we stare at a subject too long, it can often distort. You know, it, 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 that, that level of focus can actually be harmful in a drawing. Um, but we have this idea sometimes that if we just look harder, and then the drawing will get better. Um, but it's, uh, I found that it actually can be um, detrimental to the whole process, laboring on something too long. It's, it's better for me to take a hundred quick glances at a subject than you know, one long look at it, so. Okay, what am I doing here? I'm really, that little dark spot that's on the camera lens really bugging me. <laughs> um, uh, Romero saying, in other words, we should draw the environment around the subject first. That is a really good question. Um, the, I, I think it, that that's mostly right, right? I, 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 I'm trying to check in with it because I think that is kind of what I said. Um, I, if I'm to be more specific, I think it would be, um, it, what, you're, you're, what you're doing is you're established, you wanna look for the relationship between the background and the subject first. Um, I find it helpful to actually start with that background um, because it, it often requires a little less focus. It's a great way to warm up. And then I can make decisions about the subject, the object, a bit more easily. They're in the context of that background when I start to make those decisions. So um, I find that that's most helpful for me. Um, but I, I, at the same time, you know, however you get through a drawing is you know, kind of an individual process. 
but no matter how you go through it, considering the relationship between the subject and the background is really critical. Um, I find that it is more helpful to do the background first or you know, early, um, but it may not be the case for, for everybody. Because what can happen, you know, and we, what we know about value relationships is that um, you, can, you can spend all your time getting the value right. Say, say, I, say I do this entire drawing just doing the rabbit, not doing anything with the background, that background being bright white. I could get this, this rabbit looking great, feeling confident, then add a tone in the background and it completely changes that relationship to the rabbit, completely changing my understanding of it. You know, it may no longer look good, <laughs> essentially. So um, I've, I've just learned that you kind of have to build both at the same time um, so that you, um, you, you really have a concrete understanding of the relationships between the values. Okay. But I'm, I'm feeling good, like in this in this general shape. And if if I I can compare the the drawing to the small scale reference, I'm looking at what you're seeing right now. I'm feeling like overall it's it's pretty solid, and I can start to become more detailed now. Um, I think what I I'm, I gotta come up with a plan right now. So what I'm doing is just working in that background a bit more where it requires a little less thought. I think I do wanna have a little bit of suggestion in that background of what's behind there. I don't think I wanna do, you know, even the level of detail that we're seeing in the reference image. Um, but having some sort of kind of a suggestion of, a, of an angle coming in this way, I think is helpful. Just compositionally, there's this general line here and if we kind of switch and do kind of a zigzag across the composition, um, it could be helpful to, to move the eye around. So that's just really kind of a, a compositional choice. Um, and it's all very subtle. And, now, and also by, by creating a suggestion of a dark spot that cuts across here, what it does is it, um, it creates an overlap. I've got this horizontal kind of, um, kind of thrust in that background versus the vertical aspect of the rabbit there, and that's gonna pop that rabbit forward. If I had done a vertical dark marks here, um, it would have flattened things out, so. All right, what do I wanna do, what do I wanna do? Okay, uh, I'm gonna take a quick break, check on these, um, check on these questions. Michelle says, Michelle says, I know I need to squint, but I don't need eye wrinkled. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I hear ya. Um, and Adele just takes off her glasses. Um, uh, that is art. I envy people that can do outlines of cats, horses, and such. You know what? Uh, that's it, one person to really look at is Degas. I think anybody who's interested in drawing, just study Degas. He's that. That guy could draw, holy smokes. And so he has some amazing works you know, with horses. Um, and uh, yeah, he's somebody to look at. Um, Tammy is saying I should do the short glance thing more uh, and then negative drawing. Yeah, the kind of thinking back and forth between positive and negative space, boy, that's tricky. Um, it can, sometimes it can feel overwhelming. There could be so many things to focus on in drawing. It can be overwhelming. So I hope everybody is kind of being kind to themselves here and, um, and uh, just that's, that's why we're here drawing is we're kind of getting better um, and challenging ourselves in those ways. Um, uh, Cindy is saying, I have a hard time getting tone on the paper using Derwent medium and still light gray. So it's not getting, yeah, this is actually pretty light. Um, and, and if you're using the onyx, I guess that gets about as dark as you can get with graphite. Um, but I, right now I'm hardly using any pressure with any of these, any of these marks. It's getting darker because of the, I'm building up all these layers, not because of pressure. So I haven't really even used pressure as a tool yet. Um, so maybe if, when we get through it, you know, perhaps there's an opportunity there. Um, to get, to expand that value range like you're suggest uh, like you're suggesting. So, um, all right. That is art saying. I think it could sell prints. I would. Uh, that would be interesting. He's a cute little guy. Um, 
Uh, and then Michelle is saying, I wonder if you can convert to black and white the picture. So that is something that we've also talked about in this. You can certainly do that, uh, and I've done that too. You know, so take a color photograph, convert it to black and white, and use that grayscale um, reference image to help with the drawing. And I think that would certainly make things easier. One of the reasons I like to work uh, from a colored photograph, though, is that it does provide that that challenge, um, and it helps me to develop my skills a little bit more. I can sharpen my skills more, a little bit more effectively um, when I'm being forced to interpret the value of a color. And the goal here is for me to improve my, my drawing skills so that I can apply it to my work in life when I'm out painting on location. Um, so that's, that's why I work from a colored photograph. So um, is that I, I, and I, I intentionally want that challenge, but it would be, um, you know, another option to work from a black and white photograph. You know, and you may find that, that really that's really helpful um, because it, you know, it allows you to then focus on other aspects of the drawing process. All right, what do I want to do here? I think I need to make another pass and continue to refine this. So I'm going to go through, I think I'm going to actually kind of work from the top down now and add these details. Um, Rocket434 asking, can you be my art teacher, please? Well, hopefully we can every, every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern. <laughs> um, at least I can do that. Um, let's see. Let's see. All right. Um, What do I want to do? I just check in the questions to see if there's anything. All right, so I'm going to, um, rather than draw a line, I'm, I'm looking at some of these thin marks here. I'm going to try to create these kind of short squiggles, right? I'm trying to be mindful of, if I look closely at the, the ear, I can see the direction of the fur. And so I'm kind of changing the direction of my, my pencil to align with that direction. And so then rather than creating a line that goes like this, I'm identifying that path and then creating it as a sequence of marks that move in the direction of that fur. And that's gonna help to suggest the, the fur here. So I can apply a little bit more pressure. I'm still using that overhand grip. Um, and what helps to suggest the texture is that it's, it's kind of a rocking motion. Um, and so that I, I put kind of a bit more pressure on the center of each stroke. It's kind of lifting off and landing on the page. Um, and, and in this way, you can move very quickly in, to suggest the, the texture um, without using the tip of the pencil. You can get these really fine lines um, without ever using the, really the tip of the pencil. And then I can use the tip just for certain areas where I need really do, to get in there. Um, so kind of quick glances. I'm trying to visualize there's a, there's kind of a white, the, you know, that inner ear fur that's white there. It kind of creates this arc along here. So trying to visualize that and then build up the darks in that negative space. Um, and then again, paying attention to the direction of the marks and rolling, my, rolling the pencil in my fingers so that I'm constantly engaging another um, point of that, that uh, kind of the, the core here. But you can, you can actually get a lot of detail. So here's this, like there's this, this white spot here, that's a, that's a dent in the paper. And if, you, if I need to fill that in, that's where I can use the tip of the pencil and just use these small circular marks, kind of fill that in. Um, and it's a very light pressure, but I kind of need I, using the using the screen that captures the overhead projection here. It's a little bit more effective for me. Um, I'm getting some glare on the surface here. So with it, with it in front of me, it's hard to really see um, properly. There it is saying that your rabbit seems to be smiling now. That's awesome. Yeah, you can kind of play around with the expression and it's amazing how like subtle those, those changes can be. Just the slightest change to the, the angle of the mouth, for example, can really um, impact the overall expression. 
Uh, so right in here, I want to I want to kind of address this. There's this thin um, there's this thin kind of dark edge along in here. But as you really take a look at the reference and how the how that edge varies as you follow along this edge, and you can see that you have like this dark mark up here, and then this white strip that that kind of takes over along that edge where it's lighter than. The, uh, the darker background. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull out this mono zero eraser and um, kind of suggest that. And I'm gonna be thinking about this eraser really as a drawing tool, not a correction tool. So I'm still thinking about the direction of the marks and using that to reinforce the, the, the structure of that fur. And then that way it suggests the, that, that fur texture without really having to get in there and draw it. But and you can see what happens with that edge, that alternation between the dark and light. Um, really, that's what creates volume in the, uh, in the subject. And if I, had, if I had drawn this as a dark line straight down there, it could have been a little bit flatter. It's possible that it would have ended up being too flat. So now this now we have a, a kind of a similar situation here as we follow up that back edge of that ear where we have kind of dark and then light and then into dark again. When I'm working with the eraser, I'm, I'm thinking about pressure as well, kind of starting off a little bit light, increasing the pressure as I become more confident and, and kind of see the form a little bit more effectively. And then there's this right in here, there's this kind of dark spot. And so what this is, is this mark here is really, I'm just dragging the pencil. I'm kind of letting it land and then I'm pulling away. And, and that creates these kind of sharper edges that suggest the, uh, suggest the texture a little bit more. And so now I'm doing a little bit of negative drawing. So as I'm, so I'm doing this, working on this dark area here of the ear, kind of two things at once. This is tricky because it's a, it's a relatively small area here. And so as I make these marks, I need to be mindful of this edge as well as this edge. So as I'm working on this edge, that's a positive shape against that negative shape background. But the inside is a negative shape against that white hair on top. So it's kind of serving both positive and negative space at the same time and uh, it kind of makes my head hurt a little bit. Um, uh, that is art saying sometimes it's hard to make it obvious whether that's shadow on the rabbit or if it has gray pants on. It must rely on shadow on the ground, but it doesn't always work so easily. That's, that's a, thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I wonder if anybody else has any thoughts on that. You know, where, you know, how do we how do we create a tone that reads as a shadow versus you know a new object? Um, that's an interesting interesting thing to explore. All right, so I'm feeling better about that. Like those ears, I might come back in and do a little bit of that more detail. I think what I actually want to do, um, so I'm going to wipe this whole thing down right now. I, I think I have too much of the white of the paper showing. And I like doing this because it helps to unify the drawing again. And I, I, I never kind of shy away from just wiping the whole thing down. <laughs> and then building it back up and then wiping it down, building it back up. And so what I'm, um, what I'm doing is I'm just building up that haze there and I wanna show you why. It's because now what I can do is come back in on top of the eraser 
and pull out a little bit of highlight on top of that and create some of that texture of the fur that way. That little light spot there. Um, but it can kind of allows me to control the um, the lights a little bit more by creating uh, you know more subtle ranges within that 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 light value range. So subtle contrast in that value range. I think I might need to actually tone this a little bit more. I want to make this more gray. And so actually kind of getting back to that comment about the you know gray looking like shadow, not um, not pants, um, it could be that the that there's a bit too much contrast. So try doing that, try kind of wiping it down and allowing that, that transition to become a little bit softer and reduce the contrast a little bit. And then from there, we can pull out some of the highlights and drop the shadow a little bit more. Uh, oh, Romare, yeah, I guess Romare is asking if I've only used one pencil. So far, yeah, I'm still on the medium. So it's the same, same pencil this whole time. Um, I haven't switched to the dark. Um, I think I'll, I'll bring in that dark towards the very end to kind of push the value range here in the darks a little bit farther. Um, and then, uh, and I'll bring out the eraser a little bit later to kind of push the lights. Um, so when you think about that fur, you know, so much of what creates the texture is really paying attention to the edges, you know, what's happening at that edge. And, and um, so the direction of the marks along that edge can play a big role in that. Um, so let me see what I'm going to do is I'm looking for some of the darker kind of fur in, in this area here. I'm not, I'm, I just have this eye in as a reference. What I'm trying to do is build the structure of the head first. There's this little shadow right in along in here. Um, and one of the things I'm noticing, again, I, I did this, this smaller study last week, um, and I chose to draw a little bit bigger this time. Um, and one of the things I'm noticing between the two is, is this, I just, um, I can really dig into some of these tighter areas a bit more easily. Uh, I, I, I remember really struggling with this because it was so small when I worked on that, that sheet that was smaller than eight by 10. Um, um, that, that is art is talking more about, I gotta come back to that, that comment that you're making, but it looks like you're talking about um, again, drawing shadows and then and then feeling like they're they're not necessarily part of that same form. Uh, one thing that that occurs to me um, as we're talking about that is that if you're having a trouble where a shadow doesn't read as a shadow, check the direction of your marks um, because um, what I've seen happen before, and this is something I struggled with when I was really starting out, was um, you know I would. I say draw a light area using marks that run vertically, I get into the shadow area of that same object and run the marks horizontally. When you change the direction of your marks, it gets confusing for the, the mind to make sense of that. There's a, there are these what are called gestalt principles that describe how we um, interpret visual information. And when we see things moving in the same direction, we typically, we, we would interpret them as belonging together. Things that move in different directions, we interpret as being separate. So if you have a light area and a shadow area of the same object and those marks run in different directions, it confuses the mind thinking those should be separate objects. So try making them, um, try you know, looking at that and see if the direction of the marks could be kind of playing into that, that issue. So now I'm, I'm at that part where Heather was uh, making her observations about her drawing. Um, in terms of the expression, it is tricky. <laughs> There's, there are no lines. It's like just these subtle, really subtle, um, just these areas of kind of light and dark. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm looking at this kind of plumb line here. I'm gonna, this dark area on the back side of the ear, draw up a plumb line down here. And it looks like that corner of the mouth kind of aligns with that, cuts through the eye lines with that. And now I'm kind of comparing it to this. There. 
uh, kind of just placing that corner of the mouth. Trying to visualize that path, and now I'm creating marks that run kind of diagonally. And I'm going to have to refine that, I think, a little bit with the eraser. So again, what I'm, when I'm choosing the direction of my marks, I'm trying to think about the direction of that fur. Now this is, this is really tricky in here. So thinking about the value relationships, what I'm doing now is I'm really trying to um, be sensitive to the value relationships between that fur and the background. Um, so as I, as I work under this side, it looks like the fur, the shadow side of the fur gets a little bit darker than that background. And let's see. I got to squint again. I got a little bit too focused. This is, it's all so subtle in here. It's really tricky. So this is the very, the lightest pressure, really. I'm like, I'm actually kind of resisting the weight of the pencil itself to create really fine marks to try to visualize the, um, I need to think about where, where I'm going with this. It's all so subtle in here. Okay, so I'm, as I'm working on here, I'm trying to be mindful of where I am relative to other parts of the, the rabbit. Okay. I'm, gonna, I'm just doing some measuring. Okay. I was feeling like this felt a little bit long, so I'm just double checking, taking a measurement of the, the, the width of the head here and comparing it to the body, and it seems to align pretty well with the reference. So I think I'm in good shape. But before I um, got any farther, I wanted to just do a quick double check. So as I'm looking here, like what I'm doing is I'm noticing that the, the fur is slightly darker against that background here. But as we work our way down, then it inverts, and now the background becomes darker than the, the fur. So it kind of it, it's that transition from positive drawing and then into negative drawing here. And then there's the, the, the foot here. And so when I'm when I'm doing this, I'm I'm kind of, I'm actually pushing in and lifting up. Um, and I don't know if that's really kind of showing, but that's how I'm suggesting using, through the negative space, suggesting the fur. And if I do it right, hopefully it'll actually read as the fur is on top of that background. Um, so what I need to do now is darken this back in here. So now it really starts to get subtle. But you know we're our our our, our uh, you know our visual system is really effective at seeing subtle variations in value, and so don't be afraid of that. We often have the tendency to be perhaps a bit more explicit with value relationships than we need to be. We heighten that contrast. All right, so I'm kind of digging that side here. I'm going to wipe that down. Uh, and then, again, toning the page. I know that I can go brighter with this to really pull out those highlights. So I'm not, not worried about protecting those highlight areas. Okay, so now I can work over on this side here. And now we're, we're working largely with that fur being kind of darker than that background. 
you know, it's not a light background, but this fur is darker. So again, kind of paying attention to the direction of the marks. Using the side of the pencil, I find that it just creates more natural looking marks than switching to a tripod grip and then drawing a distinct line. Just allow the, the, allow the marks to kind of do what they do, allow the pencil to kind of create some unique marks. We're not matching one hair to one hair here. We're kind of, we're suggesting. And this is a kind of a combination of both a push and a pull. So with some of those hairs, we're actually dragging and pulling in and then some we're pushing and lifting off to create some variety there and try to avoid repetition. One of the things that I have a tendency to do is um, just kind of get into a rhythm with the marks. Um, and then it leads to kind of unnatural looking marks. So. so this is where our emphasis on the, on the cross contour comes in. So when you, again, thinking about the, the grain of the fur, if we look closely, now that we can kind of focus on a little bit more, we can look closely, you can see the direction of the marks. We gotta get those, that directional quality in there because that's what's ultimately going to suggest the form. Now that we have the basic light and shadow structure, let's get those, those marks working for us here. And then I want to make sure that kind of any, any subtle variations in value that we're observing in the shadow area, that it's all very subtle. I want to, if, it's, if there's too much contrast in that shadow area, we're going to lose that form as well. So we can, as we really start to focus on here, we see, you know, subtle bounce light, um, subtle um, variations in light and dark. And as I work up to this edge, I'm really kind of prioritizing dragging the marks rather than pushing just so that it's a lighter transition. Um, Cynthia saying is I like your reference to the Gestalt. Um, I'm a professional school psychologist and part-time college uh, psych teacher. I would prefer to be a professional artist like you. Are, am I related to Degas? I'm not related to Degas. That would have been awesome. Um, but yeah, I, I think the there's a lot going on in the world of science um, and the, the study of neuroaesthetics that I really enjoy reading about, you know, that really studying how we interpret things, you know, it, when we think about how our, our eyes work, right? You know, they, we have these bouncing photons out there that pass through our lens, get focused to a spot on our retina. Our retina is just a bunch of cells that vibrate in accordance to the, uh, the wavelength of those photons. Uh, and it converts that into an electrical signal that goes to your, your brain which then takes that signal and says, oh, that vibration is this color or, you know, whatever, whatever aspect of the visual um, system it's, in, it's it interpreting. It's just mind blowing. It's all about converting um, wavelengths of light. Uh, and, but all that interpretation happens in our brains. And that's really wild. All right, so some of these darker areas here I'm identifying, you know, there's this kind of shadow side on the underside of the, the belly here in front of its back legs. And I'm trying to be um, really subtle and kind of soft with those transitions. And now I'm kind of getting in there to observe some of the subtle variations in light and dark here in the shadow areas. And I can start to see there are these subtle bands almost, you know, where there's just kind of almost waves in the fur. Uh, and if you get those angles right, that can also um, reinforce the volume of the rabbit. They kind of wrap around the back. Um, so in order to do that, what I'm trying to do is visualize that path, but again, using marks that align with the direction of the fur, not the direction of that darker spot.
and I'm still using the side of the pencil, still using that same medium onyx pencil. I haven't moved to the dark one um, yet. All right, so as I come down here, I'm gonna drop that, that leg in here. There's that dark side on that leg. And there's this, this side here and this leg. And I think, now what do I want to do? This is wrong here. Um, I need, this is all very subtle in here, so I need to define, uh, yeah, this comes up too much. I haven't defined that snow line yet. And I think that's what's some, one of the things that's throwing me off right in here. So um, what, do I, what do I want to do? I'm just kind of thinking out loud at this point. And how does this, I, can, I, need to, I need to look at that more closely. I don't know, I can't figure it out quite yet. So before I just start inventing, I'm gonna move on to another area and I'm kind of just leaving a little note in my mind to come back to this area. Um, and I got these kind of darker spots there. I don't know if there's something underneath the paper, but um, what do I do here, what do I do? Um, Romero is saying, well, thank you for this image. I have just drawn my first rabbit in snow. Mine's on a tone gray Strathmore paper. Oh, that's awesome. I, I had considered that actually. So I'm kind of curious to see how yours turned out. Um, so I hope you post it on Artist Network so I can see it, uh, where we can all see it. So that, that link is in the description below the video uh, and you'll find the, the page Okay, I'm gonna come back over here. I gotta, I gotta figure this side out here a little bit. Um, how are we doing on time? Well, we're only an hour and a quarter in, so not too bad. Um, this is really just, I'm kind of dragging down with the, the pencil. So I'm trying to let it land gently on the page and then just dragging down. Um, all right, what do I, and I gotta come in on this side here. And then this leg here, I've fallen into shadow, but I'm gonna pull out that highlight in a little bit. I think what I wanna do is I wanna be really subtle right now and try to suggest some of the, uh, the direction of the fur in this light side. Um, What am I doing here? I'm gonna, yes, yeah, these shorter marks and, and I'm trying not to, you can see how subtle I'm being. I, it's, I don't know if it's really picking up on the page or you know, on the, if you're able to see it on the screen, I can see it subtly here, um, but I'm trying to understand the flow of that fur and kind of sneaking up on it by making these, these lighter marks. And it is, it's a combination of of kind of dragging and pushing with these marks, um, but with, again, with those kind of soft landings and takeoffs on the page. What I wanna do, I think I wanna, gotta clear my head a little bit, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna darken this background. Just need to, I don't know, just move my arm a little bit more <laughs> aggressively in some areas. Um, it's kind of like, it's like, as I focus on some of these detailed areas, I can feel the tension inside of me building that needs to be released on the page. And so having a, a kind of an atmospheric background like this gives me that opportunity, which is kind of nice to have. Um, and I kind of like, 
know, I'm just kind of evaluating right now. I kind of like what's happening here, so I don't want to touch that. As I come across here, I think I want to smooth out this transition a little bit. And this is all what now what I'm doing right now is I'm as I'm talking through this, I'm kind of chewing on this area. So even though I'm not actually drawing it, uh, my mind is thinking through what I'm going to do there and what do I need to set myself up because it's so subtle. I think what I, here's what I, here's what I think I need. I think it's, I think it's hitting me now guys. So um, we've got this line here where we have dark, a little bit lighter and it's darker over here. It stays lighter. And I want this now to be lighter than that. And so I think I'm kind of inventing a little bit because I don't know as if this value contrast really exists in the photo. Um, but I need to create um, I need to create that play, that that transition um, in value relationships. So I'm going to push this down in value a little bit back in here. Kind of break up that edge and that defines now the edge of that the hair there and there's a bunch of crud under the table in that area so i think you know when i look at the reference i think i, I invented a bit too much of this that this plane here like this is a bit too too tall, that's okay. I kind of, as long as the proportions in here are all right, I've kind of I've kind of expanded the, the scene a little bit. I need to figure out this, these little paws in the, in the snow. Cute little things, huh? I haven't used the blending stump at all. I just, <laughs> I just realized that, huh? I wonder if I need it. I might pull that out. Here's what I might do actually. Here's a blending stump. And this might be helpful back in here to create a little bit of contrast between that smoother background and then the kind of the more, the, the texture of the fur. So when you're using the blending stump, you know, it's the same, um, same awareness to pressure and direction as with, you know, the pencil. It, you know, those are all opportunities to contribute to the form. And um, so it's not just, you know, we don't want to forget about the direction of our marks or pressure or things like that um, when we're using a blending stump. This is, helps just to kind of smooth this out, create a little bit more contrast. And then let's see, let me do that over here as well. And then what can what can be helpful is now that this is loaded with graphite, um, it could start to be useful in suggesting the texture of the snow. I think I've gone a little bit too dark here. So I haven't really used much of the eraser, but I'll be pulling that out. We'll adjust things a little bit. Let me see what happens in here. So as I'm kind of blending some of these marks in here, I'm, I'm also trying to be mindful of the direction of the marks in here to reinforce that fur. What's going on there? I just kind of messed that up. Let me see. That's working out all right. I think I need there's more of a distinct kind of 
hump back in here that I think I can address. Let's see. Sorry, I've kind of forgotten about the, the chat here. I got consumed in here. So let me, let me check the chat real quick. Um, Adela's saying, I still think the forehead slash nose is off. Yeah, this, I, looking at this now, there's a bit too much of, a, of an angle there. So thank you for kind of pointing that out. Um, just want to be really subtle in there. So I'm really, really drawing the background more than anything. kind of looking for kind of dark blotches anywhere. It's interesting, yeah, because I, when I look at on the screen here, I can see, I can see things that I don't see from this angle just because of the way the light is bouncing off of it. So it's really helpful. If you haven't taken some time to step back from your work, that can be really helpful. Hold it up in a mirror, take a photo of it, change the context of it. It'll help you to see things that you may be missing from your kind of static point of view. And then let's see. What do I do? What do I do? Let's see. Uh, I think I need to come back in here. I'm going to be pulling out the the um, the highlights in a little bit. So I'm still using the blending stump, um, but I'm gonna I need to use the eraser to do some kind of negative drawing in some of these areas. All right. So right in here, I don't like what's going on in here. So I'm gonna. Again, just playing with that, that sequence of light and dark a little bit, kind of creating a little bit of bounce light right in this area. Really light pressure, the same kind of gentle landing and lift off using the kneaded eraser. That's too strong, so then I can use this paper towel to kind of to knock that back down again. And Kind of getting rid of some of these blotches are kind of working against me, so I need to address that. Am I still with the medium? Still with the medium here. And I'm just really kind of working this edge along down in here. I find that until I find something that that's working for me. Um, this little mark right here is really bugging me. So I'm going to get rid of that as best I can. So as you can see, I had to try to erase as much as I could, um, and lifted it off, and then I kind of fill in that area around it. Um, Try to create a smooth, uh, kind of a smoother transition. These little, little block blobs there are really bugging me. All right. Um, Donna is saying I have put so much graphite and smudging on the paper that I'm having fun drawing with the eraser. That's awesome. Um, that's good to hear. I really like I, I like that experience as well. I don't know how everybody else kind of feels about it, but there's something nice about that negative drawing. So the tooth of this paper is something now I'm kind of I'm just looking at. There are some darker areas and some lighter blotches. I think I want to define this edge a little bit more than maybe the reference photo 
It's giving me information for about, so I'm gonna, gonna sharpen up that edge. And, as, and the same with over here. So we're still dealing with really kind of a middle value range. We like that's most of the drawing and is going to be that. And then we'll use the eraser to pull out highlights. We'll use the darker graphite um, to draw up the shadow areas, expand that value range a little bit. kind of a shadow here in the in that this snow and I'm kind of changing the direction of it right now everything kind of land leans off this way so because I have this dominant kind of slightly downhill diagonal thrust if I create a one that cuts across it it helps to balance out the composition just a little bit um, while reinforcing the, the kind of the, the direction of that ground plane okay I'm gonna use this guy right here, this, um, this rubber eraser. So I'm using an overhand grip on this, so I, I just, just like when drawing with a pencil, it just allows me to kind of create a, a slightly kind of a broader area, and it's a really light pressure on it. So I'm trying to think about the, the, the structure of the snow right now. So kind of creating something that has a bit more solidity to it. And there's, you know, because I'm using the side of the eraser, there's an aspect of blending that's happening. You can see how it's picking up graphite on there. Um, so it's not really lifting a whole lot. If I need to, just like in this area, I can, um, I can lean in on that pressure a bit more. But, um, and then I'm just kind of looking at the edges. How can I, how can I create some uh, kind of structure here in that snow? So I'm using this, this rubber eraser instead of the kneaded eraser on purpose because it, it creates kind of a, a more distinct lines. Um, and that will, uh, that I can use to my advantage in terms of, some of that cross contour that we talked about before. So it starts with a really light pressure and then in allowing the, the eraser to almost blend and then, then leaning in on it when I need to lift off more. All right, and then back in here. I'm kind of doing some negative drawing. So using that sharper edge to kind of define this, the snow back here, this light on the snow. But if I, if I get the direction of the marks right, then it'll help to suggest the fur that's overlapping it. So doing some negative drawing in there. And kind of feathering that up. So oh, what are we doing on that background? I'm gonna clear my head a little bit and just kind of, again, move to that background area. This is kind of an escape hatch. <laughs> you know, when, when things get, like, when I get too focused on something. All right, so there's, I think I wanna just kind of smooth out some of these areas. So what I'm doing is targeting some of the areas that feel a little bit light. Uh, filling those in, and then we'll we'll smooth that out. Kind of lost that initial angle that I put in earlier, so maybe I'll maybe I'll build that up again. Just 
just something back in there to to kind of imply that space. And again, it, it suggests this this motion here, that direction. Um, oh, uh, yeah, somebody asking about the eraser. Yeah, this is a Derwent kind of retractable eraser. And what I've done is I've just taken a razor blade to kind of create a, a chiseled edge. Uh, so let, let's now have some fun. I'm going to have some fun in the shadow with the eraser here. Um, so I can use kind of the sharper edge here to suggest, again, the direction of the fur. Um, and then there's some kind of bounce light. So So I'm trying to think about, the, again, the direction of the fur. And it's creating kind of a, an edge. But if I keep the pressure light, it blends a little bit, which is nice. And if I need to kind of pick off a bit more, I just lean in on it. But I like, the, I like using the eraser as a blending tool. It creates some interesting effects. Oh, there's that, that blotch that right in here. Let's see. And get rid of that. And there's something on the, the lens too. So keeping the pressure really light, I'm just really suggesting the kind of the tone of the fur here. But I, I don't want to lift it off. I, I want this to all read as shadow. And then in, in, right in this back edge, there's a bit more contrast between the light and the dark areas that I can, can pull out some more of this. And this is just using that retractable eraser again. I kind of just took a razor blade to it to create a chiseled edge. But I also, I also have this mono zero eraser which will really achieve the same thing. So let me, let me try switching to that so you can just see what that looks like. And I'm just kind of lifting off a little bit more light, a little bit more here to suggest the bounce light off the snow in the shadow area. I need the bigger reference here. And we're gonna do the eye kind of last, but I wanna, so I wanna get the highlights in here. All right, so now we kind of move into the light area and because I have that paper toned, you know, there's a there's a gray quality to this this tone area, oh, tonal area right now. Um, what I'm doing is I'm trying to target the kind of the lightest spots in this light area. And that'll create a little bit of contrast there and kind of round that out. It's gonna hopefully give some more form and volume. And it's not showing up all that well on, it's kind of getting blown out from the camera here. So I wonder if I can, wonder if I can heighten that a little bit. So I'm just, I'm gonna really push the tone down in here using that, using my uh, paper towel. That's showing up. I think that's showing up a little bit better. So I'm kind of pumping up the contrast a little bit more um, for the sake of the camera here. But hopefully, hopefully you can see it. Um, uh, Klaus Dehan is saying that left highlight really creates a beautiful contrast. So thanks. Yeah, I really like that in that in the reference photo that that play between light and shadow there. And so it's a fun thing to really focus on for this. So using the eraser here, it's, again, it's just just like with the when working with the graphite, it's a kind of a, a bit of a rocking motion with a mark. So it's a soft landing and a takeoff off the page. Um, there we go. Sorry, I'm kind of dipping into the shot there. I might have to come back in with some more graphite excuse me, more graphite there. So 
So building the, the, the eye around the eyeball, looking at that structure. How does that read? Let's see. And so I'm trying to be mindful too of the, the when I'm using this, this tripod grip here, there's this natural curve of the wrist that could be problematic. So I'm trying to be mindful of that. Um, and, and evaluating the direction of those marks. So I'm gonna I still have more work to do in the, the details there, it looks like. But looking at the trying to trying to interpret the cross contour by observing the the flow, the grain of the uh, the fur. Uh, kind of shaping the eye. A little bit. I don't want to get too consumed with that yet. I'm gonna finish building up the body here, and then we're gonna move back into that eye section. Claude is saying, oh, ugly rabbit stage. Looks like my rabbit has a paw in an electric socket. Oh, I would love to see that. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Uh, how's everybody else feeling about theirs? Uh, and if, if you're new, um, what Claude is referring to is kind of the ugly duckling stage that most drawings gonna go through. Uh, so hopefully you're being kind to yourself and just keep pushing through it. But every drawing kind of goes through that, that stage where you feel like, oh my gosh, this is not coming together. And um, but if you kind of stick with it, you know, maybe the drawing doesn't come together, but it can be a good learning opportunity. So never let a drawing go to waste. Okay. Uh, Rocket434, I have an important question. How do you sharpen your pencils so that they are so long? I mean, what do you use? Uh, I mean, what you use in the background? So I just use a razor blade to sharpen the pencils, and I can kind of show that in a little bit. Um, it takes a little while, but uh, you know, I find that you know, I, I don't really have to go back and resharpen my pencil as I work. So, um, uh, it just kind of what works for me. So I'm just kind of just racing out in this light area. It helps suggest that fur. Um, this is, you know, when I wish I could rotate the paper, I'd actually flip it upside down to do this just because it, I think it would help the, the natural curve of the wrist would benefit this. So, um, but can't do that, so. I'm sorry, I'm dipping into the shot there, so let me pull back. And then erase that light out on the, the fur here. And then actually I'm gonna drop the tone in here a little bit. So creating a little bit of contrast so the snow is slightly darker than the white fur, I think will be helpful. And then kind of pulling out the, the strongest highlights more in the center of the form uh, rather than the outer edge. All right, so let me, I'm gonna switch to the dark now. Come back in and, and really push the, the depths of the darks in some areas. So back up here to the ear, which we weren't quite done with, but it felt like it. And I'm pushing that value range just a touch by bringing in some even darker areas.
and then right in here. I think I'm gonna let this shadow area be that dark. If I darken this area here, creating a little bit more contrast, that's gonna push, pull that edge of the ear forward and create more depth along in here. So the darks on the outer portion that are actually closer to us, I'm gonna make those a little bit darker um, and in hopes that what that does is it allows that to advance and create more form. Maybe add a little bit down in here to create some variety so this isn't too flat. Okay. And now let's see, what do I wanna do? There's just some, I think I can kind of suggest the flow of the, the fur a little bit more in some of these areas. A few little ticks and knocks there. I tell, called out earlier, kind of the shape of the head along in here. So I want to try to address some of those issues that are still lingering. Um, so thank you for pointing those out. You know, remember with values, what we do is we're constantly calibrating our values. So we get, we kind of get used to the value range that's in front of us. And so, you know, some, you know, we'll, we'll look at those dark areas and we'll just assign that as being dark or black. Um, and then when we pull out something that's even darker, it provides a new context for those values and you interpret them in a new way. Uh, so you look at something and you're like, oh, that's, that's black. And then you go darker and you're like, oh, that, that stuff that was black is now has more life to it. Uh, what do I want to do? So what I'm doing is I'm just pushing those, these dark areas a little bit um, in some areas. So where do I need to go? I need to go right in here more. I think I need to add a little bit of depth. And, and in that, what happens is that if you you know, if you find the average value for a dark area first, and then you find a few spots where it gets slightly darker, um, it, it adds to the kind of transparency of those dark areas. And all of a sudden, what might have been flat will feel like a transparent shadow. Um, and I, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't remember who asked that question about it, but basically, like, how do you distinguish a gray area as a shadow versus pants? That's one of the ways, is if you see the transparency in the shadow areas, um, and, and you have a little bit of value variation in there, that can, that can go a long way in terms of uh, improving that. And actually, I think what I wanna do is I wanna pull this out a little bit more they pull that snow back in on top of the rabbit there. There we go. Okay. And then we're almost to the eyes. We're almost going to get there. We're going to get there soon. So kind of saving that part for last. So I'm just trying to be really sensitive to the, the areas where I'm bringing in the darker darks. Kind of sneaking up on it, adding a little bit, evaluating, do I need more? There we go. So getting a little bit of contrast back in there. Um, I don't really know what I'm kind of playing around back in here to see what works. This is still at that tricky spot, trying to figure out what to do in that back end, but I, I'm feeling like that's working. And just what I'm trying to do is look at kind of critically at the relationship between the fur and the snow to define that. And find that balance between it being subtle versus kind of descriptive and more explicit. So I'm feeling better about that. 
Um, I think what I want to do, this is, this is bothering me here. It feels like kind of a white halo, which is no good. It's kind of flattening things out. So I'm kind of filling in that light area, smoothing that out. And then I'm going to come back in on top, kind of sharper fur here. And that dark edge kind of wraps around. And then the, there's a bit of a light that's catching in on here that starts to take over as we come down. So it goes from light, light against the dark down here to then, um, then the shadow side right in here being darker than that. So what do I need to do up here? I think I need to define this a little bit more and then maybe just a subtle darkening back in here to pop that edge. Pop the edge of the head out a little bit. So I really want to be careful because I don't want if it, I need to feather it out sufficiently so it doesn't feel kind of like a dark halo on there, which would then have a uh, dark, uh, that would end up flattening things out. So, so it's a very light touch. Just if I need more pressure, just kind of gradually leaning in on it, feathering it out and taking multiple passes so that I don't get strong marks in here. There. And I don't know if anybody could really see that, but it's all very subtle at this stage. All right, let's get that eye in. I think we're kind of at that point. So now as I'm looking at that shape, um, what I'm trying to understand is that the, the ball, the eye is, a, it's a ball, it's a sphere, but then you have those, you know, the white furry lids <laughs> kind of covering over. Um, and there are certain parts, because we're, it, because the, the head is at an angle, there are certain aspects to the curve here that represent the sphere of the ball and then other curves that represent the, the curve of the eyelids that wrap over that sphere. So I think understanding what I'm looking at, I think is gonna be really helpful. So as I, as I look in here, for example, that this mark kind of represents the sphere of the ball, the eye, and then we have a, an eyelid that kind of wraps in on top. And then, um, and then we have another eyelid underneath here that kind of wraps in over it. And we kind of have a slight pinching in there. I'm feeling like the, the, the size of the eye is all right. It doesn't feel quite 100%, but I think it's close enough for, for what we're doing here today. Um, just kind of clearing my head a little bit, so I'll work a little bit on it, um, and then come back. So I want to get that highlight in. And kind of, so I'm erasing out, and that's, of course, way too big. Um, but if it's in generally the right spot, what I can do is kind of work around it. And rather than outline the highlight, I'm using these small kind of circular marks uh, starting just outside that highlight and then working into it to kind of make it smaller. Because if I outline it, that'll actually flatten things out. that little pinprick of light there I think is all we need. And then I'll work from this, you know, from the center out. And one of the things I'm observing with the, the sphere of the eyeball is that there's some bounce light coming in from this direction. So there's a, a subtle lightening along this edge that I might increase. So, so I'm, I gave it kind of a dark value, but it's not the darkest I can go. I'm going to come in a little bit darker in here. Um, and that'll help to create some of that rounded suggestion. Let's see, and then there's this lower eyelid here. Um, so hopefully what this is conveying is that it's, when you're constructing the eye, you're really 
you're really constructing it. It's not drawing a line and then kind of filling it in. It's not, you're trying to see the subtle um, changes in the shape. And so as I kind of evaluate it from a distance, kind of reading the expression on it, see does it, does it capture the, the form, the expression of the eye properly, kind of making some subtle adjustments and then kind of going from there. But I feel like that works out pretty well. And ideally, um, when we look at it, it would feel like it has three-dimensional, it has, it has a three-dimensional quality to it. It doesn't just feel like it's kind of flat and kind of pasted onto it, but built into it. Um, and kind of going back to somebody's earlier observation in terms of um, drawing the background first, I kind of think about that when I'm drawing eyes, is you're building the structure around it first, and then you're integrating the eye into it. So it doesn't feel like it's like a, a Mr. Potato Head where you're just kind of plopping an eye on there, but it's a, it's a natural form baked into the structure of the head is what we want to be able to observe. Um, so now I'm just kind of going through, um, this is the, that dark onyx pencil has a little bit more, um, a little bit more kind of a substance to it. And I'm adding a bit more detail, kind of refining things a little bit. And, and now I can, you know, this is the, the point in your drawing where you're kind of in control of how much detail you add and how precise everything needs to be in terms of it, it reading accurately. Um, you know, so are some of the proportions off? And if they are off, is that something that you can live with or do you need to make that adjustment? Um, you know, does it, is this really um, about duplicating the photo one-to-one -one, or is it, um, you know, more about kind of capturing the overall kind of essence of it? So, and then, you know, you're each gonna have your own kind of threshold for that, so. Um, you can see I switched to this tripod grip, giving me a little bit more control now. Um, let's see, I think right in here I need to pop this. And I'm, again, I'm looking at the grain of the, the fur, so it's not just a thin line. I'm creating that as a, with marks that kind of, I'm jiggling in the direction of the, uh, um, direction of that fur. And so these darker marks just add a little bit of depth to the those dark areas and that's what really I think will help create a impression of it being a shadow. And as you can see as I'm making these marks there's a, a kind of a combination of flicks up and then pulling down so that there's some variety in those marks. Uh, right in here, I think I need to, in to intensify this dark in here to give some more form and volume to the ear. How's that work? And now I can come back in, and now that I've adjusted the value range over here, that, in, that changes the way I interpret the values over in this area, so I need to make some adjustments there too. Um, let's see. Just reading to see if there's any other questions here. Uh, Marie Christine uh, creates is saying, what am I using? This is a, a Derwent Onyx graphite pencil. This is the dark one. Um, <laughs> it sounds pretty ominous, the dark one. Um, but this is the, the dark <laughs> in, in the value scale that I'm working with. Um, so, um, but if, if you're following along, really any graphite material will work. I kind of like the, the soft graphite, like this onyx, because it just shows up a little bit better on camera. Um, and and I, you know, I just like softer graphite in general. All right, so I feel like that's that's working out pretty well. There might be some kind of subtle adjustments I could continue to make. Um, you know, this this whole side here is really difficult to identify the, this specific shape and form because there's just so much fur there. Um, so you can kind of make, you kind of keep pushing the background and the fur together until you get the, the right shape. Um, 
So you kind of you're kind of building the darks in the background, kind of building into the lights, and then using your eraser to pull out the lights in the in that area. Um, what do I need to do? Otherwise, I think that looks good. I was thinking about maybe darkening back here. But I don't think I want to because right now the darkest darks are right here. It really pulls the eye here. This kind of pushes back. So I'm just kind of evaluating right now, um, seeing what needs to change. Um, and uh, so far I feel like everything is working out okay. Um, so I'm adding a little bit more right in this area here to suggest some form in these lights. So very thin light marks here, but again, trying to reinforce the, the direction of the fur so that this feels like it has more volume um, and it doesn't just get blown out as a white area. And as I'm making these marks, I switch to this tripod grip, which used, it kind of engages the point of the pencil a little bit more, um, but I'm still thinking about trying to create these kind of uh, gentle lands and liftoffs with uh, the mark. And it's really just using the weight of the pencil. Um, but again, this is one of those things where you're kind of in control of how much detail you want to add. You know, I feel like we kind of, we got to the point of recognition that this was a rabbit in snow really early on in the drawing. And the rest of it is really just putting in as much or as little detail as you want. Um, so I could have stopped an hour ago and somebody could have looked at this and said, oh, I understand what that is. Um, and you know, I kind of felt compelled to continue to work on it. But um, that's what, kind of, what's, what I like about this process of allowing everything to build up at once is that we can control that. So. So what am I doing? I'm just kind of futzing around. So how'd everybody do? Hope everybody was drawing along. Um, uh, Tammy is saying, I'm having a horrible time with the head and pers perspective. I'm, I'm interested to understand that more. I didn't do the whiskers. Um, as I was thinking about the structure of the head, I'm like, wait, there's some kind of detail in here that could help. Um, so here, a few things that might be helpful in terms of the perspective in the head is we get the outer shape generally right, um, but if you don't have a sense of volume in the head, it can kind of throw things off. Um, and so what it might be helpful is to identify what that central axis is. So try to envision where a line would be if it were to run right between the eyes. Um, and it's difficult because we can't see the other eye, but we can start to imagine it. And we can see the center right here, of course, where um, the mouth and the nose kind of meet. And if you can kind of find, uh, estimate where that center is between the ears, you could start to connect the two. Um, and, and then try to make your observations around that, that center line. Um, and so you, as, you, as you look here, for example, the, the fur runs in one direction. As we come on this side of that center line, it moves in a different direction. It starts to change. Um, and that can help to reinforce the, um, the, the, the structure of the head. Um, and so then as we come down here, there's kind of like this triangular area here. There's a plane. If we come down, it's more vertical along this section. Um, and right in here, it starts to kind of come out a little bit to create this kind of rounded quality. Um, and again, it's all very subtle. But if you're able to um, locate that in the reference image, that might be helpful. Um, so then you kind of switch to thinking really about the structure of the head and then adjust the outer edge in accordance with that. Um, so I don't know if that makes sense. All right, let's get these whiskers in there. Um, we've got some that are kind of dark, some that are light against there. So I'll get the dark ones in first. And I like to use, I like to use the, the side of the pencil. So you switch to this overhand grip. Um, and I can, what I can do is I, I, I want to try to visualize the path of it first and then strike. I only got really one shot at this. Um, you know, if I, if I don't hit it right, I kind of have to race it out, smooth out the area and then try it again. So I'm going to see, and, and getting the right, exactly the right angle is not super critical. What I would need to do is figure out where is it starting from? 
and where is it exiting? Like how far do I need to go? So I'm gonna see this one in here, kind of figure out where I need to go, and then just kind of drop it on. Kind of clean that up a little bit. Um, and then there's one down in here. I'm gonna keep these lines light because these are ultimately gonna be light against that dark background. But you can see that they start dark and then they, they kind of trail into a light area. Um, sorry, I'm kind of focusing, so talking and drawing is difficult. And then in here, I can take this you know, either, you know, if you have a rubber eraser, you can use a razor blade to kind of shave it down so you get a sharp point like that. Or I can, you can use a smaller eraser like this Mono Zero. Actually, I'll use the bigger one, see if we can get that to work. So I've got that sharp edge and I'm gonna place that where I need it. And then kind of flick that out and try to get a, get kind of, get that whisker identified. Let's see. And this kind of favors subtlety. Like I didn't even notice the whiskers <laughs> until the very end. And so it shows you that you don't need to be super explicit with them. Um, you know, for you, maybe you the first thing you notice were the whiskers, but for me it wasn't. I could have probably left it out and they would have, it would have been fine as a drawing, but um, it kind of shows you some of those details are really not as important to the drawing as we might think. So I'm just kind of erasing out some of these lighter areas. Um, Steven is saying, I just noticed he has some shading under the eye that adds more depth. Yeah, there's a bit of a um, kind of shift in tone right under here that I don't know if it's really showing up. I can see it a little bit more clearly in my drawing here than I can on the screen, um, but that's a really good observation and that it, it helps to define that plane um, as distinct from the, the top head plane there. And then there's, I think, I think I, I do want to define this edge a little bit more clearly. And how do I do that? Um, I think what I need to do is darken this just a touch. So kind of really, really kind of a light, soft gradation there. And I can, I can, I can sharpen this edge along in here too. So kind of moving back and forth, going up to that edge and back, into that edge and back to, to create a soft transition so I don't end up with a really significant dark halo along that edge. How's that? Yeah, that kind of sharpens it up a little bit and it gives me a little bit more um, contrast. I can maneuver a little bit more in terms of value in this area when I do that. This is that modified grip that I was talking about earlier. So it's just kind of wedged in my fingers here using the side of the pencil, but I'm able to stabilize it using my fingertips like in the tripod grip. I, I, what I really like about this kind of modified overhand grip is that it, it, it allows you to use the side of the pencil while also giving you control, the same control you would have with using the tripod grip. Okay, and then what I'll do is I'll kind of Pull out some of the, the fur along in here. And define that edge just a little bit more. There we go. That feels a little bit better. Um, so how'd everybody do? Let's see, I'm gonna look for questions. Can you pull the light part of the whiskers out with a mono zero eraser? Absolutely. And I think that was my first uh, impulse, Greg. Um, but I thought, well, why don't I kind of challenge myself using the bigger one? <laughs> it, I think it would have achieved the same. The Mono Zero eraser I really like is just a harder eraser, which is kind of cool. Um, it gives it a little bit more precision. Um, 
it. And so what I'm going to doing now is I'm looking for areas where the edge seems a little bit too soft. can sharpen up some of those areas if I need to. Um, but I think overall it's working out. The eye is too small. So here's what I'm going to do. And I, I feel confident with this section here. I'm now just going to kind of work in there and ex ex expand it a little bit, kind of gradually make it larger. That's something I just didn't notice before. So some of those things that it just happens in drawing is that you, you know, as you sit with something, your your per your perception of it will change, and so what looks right at the time over you know, when you look at it with fresh eyes may no longer be working so there yeah, that feels a little bit better how's that it's weird when i when i'm looking at the larger reference here the eye feels larger but when i look at the small one it feels more correct but i do think it still needs to get even bigger so i'm just going to gradually increase it Uh, it's changing the the placement of the uh, the um, the highlight, but that's all right. It's still working. And then I can change this angle here. And then, you know, what I'm looking at now is just, you know, breaking up that, that edge around the eye. So, you know, in some areas, kind of flicking it upward to suggest the fur, like right in here, I can do that. And in other areas where I can sharpen it to suggest the, the smooth surface of the eyeball, kind of back and forth between those two. There, that feels better. May not be 100%, but it's getting there. Okay, um, let's see. It says I'm Tammy is saying I'm working on the spot. I'm ha you're working on the spot I'm having trouble with on the mouth. So if you need any suggestions with that, let me let me know. I'm kind of curious how that's going for you. Um, Donna is saying I've changed the length of the bunny about three times, even though I thought I proportioned it. Yeah, <laughs> I feel their pain. I've had that happen so many times. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, because that certainly happens as part of the drawing process. So it's, it's awesome and encouraging to, to hear that you went with it because it's so easy sometimes to notice uh, you know, that something is off in terms of the proportions and then just say like, I don't want to do it again. And you just leave it. <laughs> and then you know in the back of your head that it was wrong. Um, so I think it takes a lot of discipline to correct those things when you see them. So well done. Again, thanks for thank you for sharing that. So, um, just I added a little bit of dark there just to kind of break up this edge, create a little bit more variation there. Um, yeah. Okay. Looking at the and Lindy, I you have explained proportion, and I need to work on it more. That's been my biggest problem. Yeah, I, I think the, um, yeah, it, it, that's true for me as well, and it varies by subject. So next week I will be working on a portrait, I think, and I really struggle with that. So if you kind of join me next week, hopefully you'll see, um, yeah, me kind of struggle through those same issues. Um, so with landscape, I just do so much more of it. I can hit those proportions a bit more accurately, more quickly. With other subjects like a portrait, I really kind of struggle with it more too. So it's I I, I feel your pain, um, but I think the fact that you're focusing on it is really kind of essential. And it's it's something that um, you know sometimes we just don't really have that focus, and and sometimes it's it's to easy it's easy to recognize that something's off, but we don't know what with it with the proportions. And so um, if you just keep at it, and especially if you, you spend that time early on, so when we saw the early stages of the, the rabbit, it was just these big blobs of, blobs of value. Spending your time at that, at that stage to get those big proportions down um, 
will ultimately serve you in the end. And so I've run into trouble with proportions most when I, I, I kind of get to the level of finish too early and I haven't fixed the major proportions initially or I'm too confident in those major proportions. Um, that's what happens when I work with portraits a lot is, is that I, I feel more confident in those proportions early on and so then I stick with it only to find out towards the end of the drawing after everything's rendered that I was way off. Um, and so I, you know, like I said, hopefully next week you'll, you'll see me struggle with exactly, exactly the same thing and then we can kind of work through it together. So, um, yeah, I'm, right now I'm just kind of putzing around, not really adding a whole lot to it. But I think, you know, one of the things that I like to think about is like, it kind of the, essentially the more I work on the texture, the better it gets. Um, you know, I, I, uh, so I, as long as I'm not being too aggressive with it, I can keep kind of putzing with the, with the, the texture and generally it just gets better and better. So um, you may find yourself in that spot as well. Um, but I, I try not to, to get too fixated on one area. Kind of keep moving around make a few quick observations and then move along to the next spot. So I'm just kind of adding this little, this subtle dark line here to, I kind of see it in the reference and I might be exaggerating it a little bit, but I like that it helps to define the volume a little bit more. And then they're going to darkening this spot in here just a touch create, help to create some of that rounded effect. All right, Whew. I think that is it. Oh my gosh, it's already 3.15, my time. We've been over here two hours, oh my gosh. So thank you, um, thank you all for being with us. We meet every Thursday, every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, I wanna check on these questions real quick, but if you haven't, if you got a bail, you know, check out artistnetwork.com. You can find the link and you can go to the, the show page here. And if you keep uh, looking there, people will start, they'll, you'll start sharing your, uh, your drawing soon as you can kind of see what everybody was working on. So I want to get back to see if there's any questions. If you do, um, ask them now. Um, there's a bit of a delay, so I want to make sure that I find everything before I sign off. Um, oh, that's right. Monica is asking about sharpening the pencil. Um, and there was a question about that earlier. I can't remember if that was you or not, but the way I sharpen my pencils, I just, I have a razor blade like this. And actually, let me just, let me sharpen it right now. Um, and I'm really just kind of pushing into it um, and trying to you kind of sharpen it that way. And so I'll kind of switch between kind of scraping it like that to smooth out any big bumps and then pushing it this way and gradually just kind of refining it. And the sharper the blade, the better, um, especially if you're sharpening charcoal pencils, which break more easily. So you really have a sharp pencil um, but that's really how I sharpen it. Um, and you'll notice that like as you, the angle that you're holding the blade affects it. So the steeper the angle, the more it digs in and it really kind of, it'll take big chunks out of the graphite. Um, and the more shallow, it'll just kind of scrape it. So you find the right angle that works for you. So it takes some refining and really kind of sculpting the, <laughs> sculpting the blade a little bit, but that's the, uh, that's really the, what it's all about. It's no more complicated than that. Um, let's see. Sevi is saying, well, mine looks like a bunny. That's awesome. And I'm glad to hear that it was a success for you, though. It looks like he's sitting on a, in a, in a puddle instead of fluffy snow. Well, it, it's, uh, it's tricky. It sure is tricky. I didn't really spend much time on the snow. Um, one thought actually right in here, this part feels really flat. So, uh, you know, quick way to kind of give it more dimension is to create some more variety in terms of value. So if I were to kind of darken this area along in here, it'll start to establish this kind of plane along in there. And then, uh, yeah, that sometimes just a very subtle, subtle change in value is enough to create uh, some structure. And 
All right. Um, uh, Monica, all right. Yeah, give it a shot. See how the razor works. Um, it's something that I've, it's not something I've always done. Um, it is just kind of lately, last few years that I've been doing that. But for the most, you know, most of my drawing career, I just used a regular pencil sharpener. Um, so there's, I, you know, I don't want to say that this is the best way to do it. It just seems to be what works for me. So, and it just allows me to use the side of the pencil a little bit more. So, all right. I want to thank everybody for joining. It looks like all the questions are in. I will see you all next Wednesday.